Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have a favorite return guest of ours here on Mormonish. We have the wonderful Rob Lauer. How are you, Rob? I'm good. I'm excited. Christmas is coming. It's my favorite time of year. So good yep. to see you. you guys looking very festive. And you look festive too, Rob. So this is very Thank exciting. <laughs> we have a very festive episode planned, actually. This is great. So why don't we let Rob, I, I did say he was a returning guest, but maybe not all of you have caught our past episodes with him. So why don't you introduce yourself just quickly, Rob, and then we will dive into our fun and festive topic. Sure. I'm Rob Lauer. I'm former LDS. I'm a reform Mormon. I'm a playwright. I've written a couple of shows, Digger. Uh, and the Beehive State, a former director of the Hillcomora pageant, and I currently do a TV talk show here in Virginia and edit a local magazine. There it is. Wow. <laughs> and we'll link um, some of our other episodes that we've done with Rob into the show notes so you guys can get more of Rob because he's one of our favorite guests and he's absolutely amazing. So Landon and I had talked about doing an episode about Christmas, kind of the history of Christmas. And I was on Rob's Facebook page and I'm like, oh, look, he's already tackled this. So let's come on the show and talk about it. So we are going to talk about the war on Christmas, Puritan style, because I think a lot of us have this idea that Christmas has always been this beloved, amazing holiday. And that is not always the case. So Rob's going to kind of take us on a little journey, the history of Christmas. And then we have a surprise at the end for everybody. So take it away, Rob. Well, you know, about probably 20 years ago, you started hearing, especially among evangelicals, about the war on Christmas, because people were saying happy holidays, trying to be inclusive of Jewish Jews who celebrate Hanukkah and other people that celebrate other things. And uh, that was taken as a war on Christmas. And then you'd be using Xmas instead of spilling out Christmas. Uh, so you, that, you started hearing that. But what's interesting is that uh, there was actually a war on Christmas that began in the U.S. or what would become the U.S. back in the 1600s in New England. It was waged by the Puritans. So we have this <laughs> idea that, you know, for hundreds of years, Americans have put up Christmas trees and everybody celebrates Christmas has a good old time and sings carols and pretty much the same sorts of things we've been doing for about the past 100 and 130 years. That wasn't the case at all. So you sort of see there on the screen what we sort of picture. We sort of take our modern day current things and plug it into past times. But it was actually a little bit different, especially in New England, which was the most religious part of the colonies, the original colonies. And uh, this is actually uh, what was going on. The Puritans hated Christmas. They were trying to erase from Christianity any vestige of Catholicism. And of course, Christmas is uh, short for Christ Mass. It was the Mass that was given, I believe, around midnight on Christmas Eve in the Catholic tradition. And the Puritans were trying to strip away everything that smelled the least bit like Catholic, and especially Christmas, which uh, had been a huge holiday for, uh, especially in England and in, and in Europe, uh, for, for, for good grief, centuries, if not close to half a millennia by that point. Uh, King Charles, you know, was a big fan. You know, there were 12 days of Christmas. Christmas, even today, on the uh, liturgical calendar that used by most Christian denominations in the world, Christmas begins September, I'm sorry, December 25th, and it ends January 5th. And, and then there's a whole four weeks before Christmas that's Lent. And then after Christmas, you have Epiphany. But uh, yeah, uh, celebrating Christmas in, in England, especially, that was a big deal. And there were 12 days that started on uh, the 25th of Christmas uh, of December, and it went through January 5th. And the most celebrated day, the biggest day of the whole celebration was actually the last day, the 12th night. Uh, thus, Shakespeare wrote a play okay. for the 12th night festival and called it 12th night. But um, I mean, in England, they just, it was just a day, 12 days of partying. I mean, just best. Well, the Puritans weren't really into partying either. So they, yeah, I can see like that. That. <laughs> that seems to be exactly the opposite of what they were, yes, yeah, they were, they were interested in. Yeah. Power. And so they didn't want anything that smelled Catholicism or paganism or drunkenness, debauchery, which uh, Christmas actually in England was a very, and until about 150 years ago, was actually a very adult celebration. It was more a time of parties as in partying, 
uh, drinking punch, aka alcohol, <laughs> and uh, all of that. And uh, it didn't really have the fantasy elements and the, the childlike things we've come to, we've, that we have incorporated in, in, in Christmas over the last 100, 150 years. So uh, Parliament, there was the Puritan Revolution in England, and uh, the Puritans took over Parliament. And one of the things that they did was outlaw Christmas uh, in England. Now, the Puritans in uh, the American colonies, uh, they pretty much only controlled Massachusetts Bay. Um, the two biggest colonies at that point, biggest one was Virginia, where I'm from, where I am right now. And then there was the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, and that was founded by the Puritans and Puritan separatists who were actually trying to get away from Europe and come over here and start a new Jerusalem. Sound familiar? Yeah. And sort of create Zion on earth. <laughs> uh, and part of that was, of course, getting rid of, rid of anything pagan or Catholic. And that meant Christmas. And so in Massachusetts, they outlawed Christmas. And uh, it was just, um, you could there could be services, but... Um, if it was on Sunday, but if the 25th did not fall on a Sunday, you were actually fined and maybe jailed if you closed your business. You had to work on the 25th. You couldn't take the day off. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it was a bit, that was actually the first war on Christmas. And even though this only lasted for about 20, 30 years in, uh, yeah, um, it basically, um, was if you did celebrate Christmas, it was on a Sunday, you went to the church, it was fasting, it was praying, there was no celebration, and of course, no mention of the word Christmas. So that sounds uh, that like an LDS, the that first sounds like an LDS service. It does sound like an LDS <laughs> service, fasting, <laughs> praying, no mention of the word Christmas. So, Well, you know, and, when, I, when I joined the church in 77, yeah, I was surprised because I think that year... Christmas Eve, or it was either the day after Sunday or that Sunday, but we talked about Joseph Smith's birthday, but not too much about Christmas. <laughs> well, well, we right can't forget his birthday's on the 21st of December, so it's... Or it's is it the 3rd? Is it the 1st? It might be 23rd. I think it's the 23rd. Right. I think I had a boyfriend I think, I think who was born I think on it's that the 21st. Day. I think it was, at, it was the uh, winter solstice. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Well, and something else very big happened on December 21st. Uh, of 1843, which would have been Joseph Smith's last birthday, that is when Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol. That's when it hit the streets. Well, that's kind of ironic. So, I know. So it, and there's it this is the 23rd. It is the 23rd. I knew it. I 23rd? knew my boyfriend okay. was right. Don't, yes. don't question Rebecca's birthday. I'm sorry. No, no, don't <laughs> question my boyfriend's. It's because he was very self-righteous and he's always like, I was born on the same day as Joseph Smith. Yeah, exactly. Oh Girls out there, if anyone pulls that kind of stuff, just don't. Just trust me. I've been there, done that. So. Anyway, this this slide is funny because I think a lot of us had heard that rumor. Um, Oliver Cromwell, you know, famous Puritan, outlawed mincemeat pies, right? That's one of the rumors. But of course, it just means mincemeat and everything, right? The war everything. on Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. So so even though we even after that became it became it stopped being illegal in Massachusetts in the I don't know, 1660s, 1670s. I think we have a slide that shows the yeah. dates later. Why don't you, yeah. And look at this even public yeah, I mean, notices. The, <laughs> yes, you could go, you know, you, you were actually jailed. It was forbidden <laughs> to do anything, you know, merry and festive oh. around Christmas. You could not celebrate, you know, no happiness in Massachusetts. Oh. I know. I love that cartoon. Landon, can you read that? It's so funny. I think that's Santa right in the middle or St. Nicholas. I I can. Yeah, I can try to read just that. the cartoon, just the bubbles, just the conversation um, bubbles. Yeah, it says keep, they're written in Old English. Keep out you. Uh, uh, I, I can't read it. <laughs> Rascal, I think, or something like that. Keep out you something anyway yeah, all that, right that may, that may not be santa claus and nicholas because they actually weren't really a big part of christmas in europe and in, or in the u.s yet okay it could just be somebody celebrating christmas though but basically when i could read it a week or so ago it was someone <laughs> in the middle who was pro christmas and the people on the side were casting him out of town because he dared to you know suggest that they celebrate or be jolly and then on the left you have the public notice 
that says the satanical practices are hereby forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> satanical practices of Christmas. Yeah, that's yes. not Santa Anical. That's <laughs> satanical. So yeah, the boy, they really did not like Christmas, which is just so ironic that now today, you know, they claim that others, I mean, the Christian well, yeah, the, the very, that others the very evangelicals that were sort of you know, de decrying the war on Christmas from the right. secular media are ba basically the theological descendants of the Puritans. They have the yeah. same theology. They're all Calvinists. Th so that's the ironic part. That's yeah. super ironic. Let's look at our next slide. I think we have a couple just showing this war. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yes. In the stocks instead of stockings, right? And here we can read this. It says, ho, 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 indeed. This <laughs> should teach the rascal. And it's, um, I think maybe Santa, because there yeah. is a wheelbarrow or a sled, or it looks like it's a bag full of yeah, toys. Yeah, that looks like a and later... A later a modern edition. cartoon that's uh, stuck him in there. Yep. Yeah, um, yep. yeah. He's in the stocks, literally, for just yep. trying to spread some Christmas cheer. <laughs> so, although, you know, it's interesting because I do have relatives um, that do take Christmas a lot more seriously mm -hmm. and more religiously than yeah. other people in the family. And there's a big difference. You know, you have some people that are into the whole whimsy of it, like you said, in the Santa and everything. And I have other family members that are very serious about it and, you know, just reading the scriptures and doing the things that would be more the religious yeah. side. So I can still kind of see that today. You know, I think they kind of look a little at the rest of us that are like crazy with candy canes and kind of yeah. like this is not the meaning. So, you know, there may be some of that still today a little. Uh, yeah. How come the more religious it becomes, the less fun it can become? Is, there, there seems to be My this vibe. <laughs> you, you can't <laughs> have any joy what, or fun. But well, what's so funny is, is, is the Catholics fun. didn't have that problem. And, yeah. you know, and, and uh, when Europe was Catholic and right when it was really Protestant, I mean, Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth didn't have a problem partying okay, at Christmas and being religious too. Yeah. I mean, and, and here in Virginia... I recently read an article of this in, in my, the magazine I edit. I mean, the, all the traditions of England, you know, the 12 days of Christmas were celebrated in the South in colonial America. You know, so there was lots of, there was going to church on Christmas Day, but there was partying and drinking and yep. uh, shooting guns in public and having wrestling matches and putting on plays and basically <laughs> just cutting up for 12 days. Oh. And then really, you know, partying the night away on the 12th night the last night of Christmas. See, that sounds amazing. And it sounds like you're able to incorporate everything. There's a time for a religious element. And then there's just a time for a human celebration with well, friends and family. Christmas itself is the result of incorporating pagan traditions and cultures. Mm -hmm. When it became the official religion of the Roman Empire, well, they controlled part Britain and, and part, much of Europe. And so when they started having uh, sending missionaries to those places, in order to convert the people, they incorporated things like Yule, which was the 12-day the celebration among the Germanic tribes. And it was a pagan celebration, but that evolved into the 12 days of Christmas, you know? And um, so all these pagan things, I mean, the Puritans are right about that. Much of what we do uh, traditionally with Christmas is pagan in origin, but it was the way anciently you know, uh, a conquering empire basically incorporated its people. There were concessions culturally, and the two cultures sort of merged together in order to establish a unified, peaceful, you know, for that time, uh, existence. And so it was nothing at all for or the early Christians, the first Christians who incorporate the pagan celebrations and things into Christianity in order to win people to their side. It was all Yeah, and that makes sense. Even the date the of Christmas. And, yeah. These Even purists the date. who thought that, oh, no, we need to go back to whatever it was before all that. Exactly. Nobody the primitive knows. church. <laughs> yeah. But, but even Christmas even... Day is on this, you know, incorporated a winter solstice celebration. Yeah. So that, yeah, exactly. like you said, both cultures merged. And I think that's beautiful. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But you're yeah. right. Then in hindsight, the Puritans, you know, have such a problem with what they consider paganism when really it's been the tradition for centuries. I mean, yeah. that just is naturally what happens to humanity. You meld, you mesh, you bring people together and you come out with a, a more beautiful No religion just starts from point zero. Exactly. It, every religion evolves from a pre-existing yep. culture and religion and it yep. adopts as it grows. And it's, you know, the fundamentalist mindset resists that and tries to go back to something they imagined was pure, as if you know, every, your faith had a, a, a zero starting point where there was nothing before that. And then boom, there it is. It's never the case with religion or anything human. Yeah. 
That is such a good point, Rob. I think we all need to pay attention to that. That is absolutely a great point. Let's look at our next slide. We just have a couple slides here kind of following along with our convert. Oh, here we go. Where's your ho, ho, ho now, Santa? So I ask AI, what would it look like if Santa was in a, a Puritan jail? And this is what it came up with. <laughs> <laughs> and Santa really, I mean, he, he was brought over by the Dutch and the Germans. And so and like the uh, night before Christmas, I think was written around 1826, 27. And that's the first time we really had a big mention of him in American literature. And then when the Germans uh, started coming over and, and much more heavily in the 1840s and 50s and beyond, they brought that over along with Christmas trees, which also became a big thing when uh, Queen Victoria married Albert, who was a German prince. And their first year uh, of marriage, they set up a Christmas tree that was reported in the English press. Suddenly, everybody in England wanted to imitate Victoria and Albert and have a Christmas tree. And that spread over to the U.S. too after after that point. So by the time of the Civil War, Christmas trees were now a common thing in American homes. But even then, that was it was pretty new. It was only fifteen or twenty years old at that point. But like in Nauvoo and uh, in colonial America, there wouldn't have been Christmas trees either, just because hmm. nobody they hadn't come over. The Germans hadn't incorporated them yet. Into Isn't our that culture. Interesting. Yeah, it's just a hodgepodge of traditions and things that work, and and it is. It's a human celebration, and I love that. They Let's look call at our next Chris slide. Mutt, because it's just Chris a, Mutt. It's a, it's a combination. Of so many yeah. breeds. There. That's a good one, Landon. I love it. Uh, let's see. What's our next slide? Here we go. Oh, those are the dates. Now you can talk yeah. about the dates. Yes, yeah, so 1642 to 1660, no Christmas in England, and 1659 to 1681, no Christmas in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Luckily, in Virginia and the Carolinas, and uh, they're, um, you know, they were Anglican and they didn't pay attention to the Puritans and they were sort of left alone. Plus, these were the colonies that were settled sort of by the uh, children of the really rich British folk right. and so the lords and ladies and all that stuff. So they continued to, you know, party hardy down here for 12 days. So, and, so, uh, so yeah, they crossed the state border to go have <laughs> a party or yeah. this, uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, but then even after that, after it became legal around the same time that it became legal again in Massachusetts, you had Pennsylvania had been, had been established by that point, which was a colony that uh, was established as a refuge for anyone uh, who had been persecuted in any part of the world because of conscience. And so they really uh, pushed freedom of religion there. And you had a lot of very, at that time, very strange movements and sects moved to Pennsylvania, among them Amish and Mennonites. And the Mennonites tended, and Amish tended to be very serious about Christmas. Uh, they didn't do a lot of the partying and stuff. It was basically a day of going to church and all, and, uh, you know, prayer and all that on the 25th. But the 26th of December, they called it Second Christmas, and that would be the day when the Amish and the Mennonites would go out and have dinner with family and do that sort of thing. But it still wasn't the raucous partying and things like that that other Europeans engaged in. And then the Quakers uh, had nothing against celebrating the birth of Jesus, but they were, they did not, they believed that every single day of the year was holy. And so they didn't have holidays at all. They, the way they wanted to esteem every day as being holy. And so the early Quakers, uh, while being Christian and not really forbidding the, the celebration of Christmas. They just didn't. They didn't seem think that was necessary. Every day should be celebrated. And so they were sort of a positive way, but still no Christmas for a, a number of years. And after a few decades, they've sort of, you know, assimilated to the rest of the society and began celebrating it too. But uh, so but the big thing is that for most of the 1600s and into the early 1700s, uh, unless you were in places like Virginia and the Carolinas and uh, Maryland, which was the Catholic refuge, Christmas was not that big of a deal for, for most of Americans. And as the move west began, a lot of the, uh, the Quakers and Mennonites and Amish who didn't make a big deal of Christmas, they moved west and settled places like Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, Nebraska. And so even in those places, Christmas was still very low key and not that big of a deal. And uh, it really wasn't until the mid 1800s. And really, Charles Dickens writing a Christmas carol really saved Christmas because he incorporated in that story a lot of the, the very simple traditions of the working class people in London. 
And uh, that really took off when people started reading that Americans too. They were just enchanted by all these neat traditions that the English, the old English had had, and they started bringing them back. And then with the wave of German immigration and the bringing in of Christmas trees and Santa Claus and the commercialization of Santa Claus, this began and shopping in the late 1800s. By the, uh, the year, first decade of the 20th century, you basically had what we have now, which is a big celebration with a lot of gift giving, a lot of marketing and merchandising, but still the religious aspects too, for those who enjoy that. Oh, it's so fascinating to study about mm -hmm. that. And I remember some of my first experiences knowing of Christmases from the past were reading the Little House on the Prairie books, Laura Ingalls yeah. Wilder. And almost every single book, there would be a, a chapter or so on Christmas, you know, and just yep. these wonderful experiences they had on the prairie, you know, in the little towns with Christmas. And I always thought, oh, that just sounds so amazing where they'd get, you know, one little piece of candy, right? And it meant everything or so those are some of my favorite books. But let's go to our next slide. I think we're almost getting to the end of these. I think it says, yes, Christmas was back, as we described. So yes. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting when you talk about these traditions, you have the different groups with the different traditions. And then as kind of I touched on before, you have different family traditions. I think it'd be interesting just maybe to talk about our different kind of the tone of Christmas in our family. For example, I'll say that my family, um, it was low key growing up. I have you know, my parents and just a sister. So it wasn't highly commercialized. There was a lot of reading of the scriptures, manger scenes acting out. There were only the two of us siblings. So we'd have our dog be baby Jesus and get into the <laughs> a laundry basket and try to keep our dog taffy, you know, held down in some swaddling clothes, things like that. So I definitely had more of a religious uh, bent to it. Um, we def <laughs> We had on Christmas mornings, we would wake up and then we made sure that we took our tithing jars with us down to the Christmas tree in case somebody were to give us cash, then we would change it out right there to make sure that we also paid our tithing on Christmas morning. I know, I know, I know. So yeah, we definitely- you tied your gifts from Santa? We tied their gifts from Santa. Yeah, that was it. So I know, I have to admit it was sad to go, oh my, aunt so-and-so gave me $10. No, no, let's, <laughs> here's what, I mean, it just- <laughs> Baby Jesus takes one dollar. <laughs> Baby Jesus gets one dollar, and the Mormon Church get yeah. So anyway, so yeah. I, I looking back at it, I do see. I mean, of course, we got to watch. You know, the, the things that were on TV back in the day. They only came on once, right? It was very exciting Fine. to watch Rudolph and all that. But definitely, my family had more of a religious, trying to very much keep the religious side of Christmas, and that was kind of us. What about you, Landon? What was your family like with Christmas? Uh, it, it was probably similar to that. I, I remember as a kid, uh, the big thing was getting, you'd wait for the Sears catalog and the JC Penney catalog to come. And then you'd start flipping through, showing all the toys that you wanted, you know, and uh, of course you had to flip through the, the women's underwear section. And that was always, <laughs> <laughs> did you land in really? <laughs> And then you'd get to the toy section. <laughs> and as you got older, it you just say the women's underwear to section. The toy section. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we were definitely, uh, uh, it, it was more a celebration of, of uh, you know, the, the day in the Santa Claus and that. Uh, obviously, the church time around it, you would, uh, the night before we'd do a, a Christmas nativity or whatever. Uh, but, uh, uh growing up mormon you didn't have the mass and the and the things that uh that the catholics had that really was a strong you know the only time you really celebrated it religiously is if it fell on a sunday and then it was like crap we got to go to church <laughs> yeah but it was always one hour church or whatever and so you were at least oh well, at least we only have to go for an hour but then you didn't know when do you open the presents? If you have yep. nine o'clock church, do you yep. wait till you come after or do you, do you try to open them before? Uh, so that was always the, uh, the, the, the testing of your faith, I guess, was do you go <laughs> to church or stay in open presence? Uh, and then, of course, visiting family once you're done with that. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up church on Sunday because as a kid, it was just annoying. Like, oh, we have to, you know, go on Christmas Day. But as a parent, it was a nightmare. Like you described, what do you do with your kids? Do they open presents before? Do they open them later? The mom has to get up like at 3 a.m. when Christmas was on a Sunday to make it all fit in. It was just ridiculous. I thought Santa Claus did that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry. Yes. Please take all children out of the room. You're right. Your mom had to help Santa get everything ready. That's exactly. Yes, she did. I don't. Do any children watch Mormonish? I'm. I'm guessing no. no. <laughs> I hope. Not. And what about you, Rob? What were your family? Because because you were raised, you were a convert really, to the yeah, church when you so, were. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a real even mixture of both the religious and and the Santa Claus and the fantasy. I mean, we there was no conflict between the two. We we weren't extreme my parents were no way extremely religious but you know our social lives were revolved around church but even people whose social life revolved around church that period were extremely religious it was just what you did culturally in the south but um you know it always began when my, my mom loved to decorate she was such a gifted decorator and she was very artistic and so she loved decorating for all the holidays and stuff so usually it started right after thanksgiving decorating little things and making little crafts and things putting them around the house and decorating and um I love Christmas music. I love Christmas music. And uh, that was such a big part of the holiday for me as a kid. I would just sit by the hi-fi and listen to the latest Goodyear tire. Oh, <laughs> I love that album. Yeah, I know we're talking about the these, same one. The tire manufacturers yep. in the U.S. for some reason throughout the 60s, every Christmas would come out with these uh, the best songs of Christmas sung by the yep. popular singers of the time. And they were a dollar a piece. And so my parents every year we get buy both albums for a dollar and I'd spend the rest of the probably listening to that. I would get so moved by that. And, you know, I, I was, I guess, more religiously minded than my the rest of my family being a weird child. <laughs> and so I would listen to those things. And if it was a religious song, I could just picture the whole nativity and just get so emotional and all. At the same time, I loved Santa Claus and the reindeers and all of that. I remember when I was very small, my brother and I were getting put to bed by my mom and my dad slipped out of the room and went outside and had some jingle bells. And he stood outside our bedroom window, ringing the jingle bells. Going, ho, 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 ho. And then he ran away and came back in like, hey, how are y'all doing? We heard Santa Claus. So they sort of made the fantasy come to life for us. And that was fun. And we, you know, we went to church and stuff. If Christmas fell on a Sunday. We usually didn't go to the church. In fact, nobody did. In fact, a lot of the times they would even cancel the church service and have one, a big one on Christmas Eve. So, um, do, do mean, you remember the department store windows? That, that was big. You know, yes. they would, the department stores would decorate up their window and almost yeah. to see who was going to have the best department store windows. And you'd go down and look at those. And, and, yeah. and yeah, that, that, that was a really cool part. And the other thing that, that really has kind of gone away. It, it was there all through my kids and all through my childhood though, was the TV Christmas shows, the Rudolph, the red nosed reindeer and frosty. And I remember I, the I, very first broadcast Rudolph. I just turned six years old the day before. Oh, I, I just, yeah. I just watched that with my grandson who is, who just, uh, he's like, uh, 16 months or something. And, uh, so it was the first time he watched it and it was just fun to watch him just sit there with big eyes and watch. And then when the, the abominable snowman came. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and because of, you know, the last, you know, almost four, 40 years or so, we've had videos and VHS and cable yeah. and all this stuff. But, you know, the, the cool thing was that they came on once a year. Once a you year. Know, one you'd time. The TV guide and you'd, you'd highlight what yeah. night the ones yeah. you and wanted. You could, and, and you could. There was no Make recording sure of home. anything. <laughs> yep. So you either had to be in front of the TV from like 8 to 830 to yep. watch it or you missed it until next year. Yep. Yeah. So one shot up. at it. Yeah. <laughs> it was like mini really? it was like mini Super Bowls for kids throughout the Christmas season. You know. <laughs> and they really stand the test of time. They really do. So do. Rob, I had to reach over to my console over here. I want to blow your mind with this Goodyear tire Christmas oh. album. Yes. There it is. This yes. is the record. This is my Christmas record. If I hear, and these are all the stars of the day, whenever mm -hmm. I hear this, I am just transported back like 45 mm -hmm. years. My sister and I would put this on the record player. We'd stare at the pictures of the artists and we would listen to this over and yeah. over. And yeah. I found this at DI last year. Oh my gosh. I know. I know. I, and so many of those artists, I mean, were popular singers like Stephen E.D. Gourmet, who were Jewish. Yeah. But they, they had a they would release these Christmas albums where they sing mostly holiday Christmas songs about snow and stuff. But yeah. you know the huge impact of you know popular Jewish singers singing holiday music aimed at a Christian audience loved it. You know, and Rebecca, when you played the record, 
remember it would get stuck and it's <laughs> just play over and over. And that's true. And especially if you had a favorite song, you'd lift the needle up and yeah, go back. And play that again. back. <laughs> yeah. You ended up screwing up that track and so the yep. needle would get stuck or jump. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've tried to play this for my kids when they were little and they're like, Oh, eh. I'm like, you know, no, you don't understand. This is the record kids. So yeah, that was a huge find when I was thrift shopping. So, well, I just think it's really fun to share memories and think about it. And, and I just love what you said before, Rob, when, you know, a lot of people think uh, that people aren't, that aren't necessarily perhaps in the cr Christian tradition now, or maybe stepped away from it. They're trying to destroy Christmas with X mess mm -hmm. or that is not the case at all. And I guess now armed with this knowledge, everybody, you can say back to them, oh yeah, well, <laughs> your 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 tradition started at first, but you know, it shouldn't even be that way. It shouldn't be a tit for tat like that. It should really just be this is a beautiful time of year and however you want to celebrate it, whatever you're celebrating. Maybe you're not part of the Christian tradition anymore and you're celebrating solstice, right? That's very important. Well, Something tomorrow, all of tomorrow. humanity yep. celebrates. Yep. I have a, my best friend is Actually, she was raised Christian for a short time. She was LDS. And, and now the, the basics, she and her family, they embrace sort of pagan traditions, Celtic yeah. traditions. Well, so tomorrow they're that's... celebrating yeah. Yule, Yule, you yeah. know. And uh, what's what's interesting, all these all the, the, these celebrations have in common, it's a celebration of light. You know, it's been mm -hmm. winter solstice is the shortest day of the year, but then their celebration goes from now on, each day gets progressively longer. There is more light, lights conquering darkness. And you have that that theme in Hanukkah and Christmas and, you know, winter solstice, all these traditions. So we're essentially celebrating the same phenomenon, light coming into the world, mm -hmm. light triumphing, triumphing over, over darkness, you know, regardless of what our theologies are. And that's beautiful because Christmas then it, it's not owned by anybody. It's not owned by one group. It's a, no. it's traditions from pagan times, Saturnalius in, uh, in, uh, Roman time is where it start, you know, had its start and then it grew. Mm -hmm. But you've got, like you said, you've got Dutch traditions, you've got English traditions, you have German traditions, uh, you have you have traditions from so many people being brought together that it's not owned by any one person. And yeah. that's what makes it magical is it's yes. for everybody exactly. and everyone can enjoy it. Nobody's stealing it from anybody. It's enjoyable for everybody because they can all take what they enjoy out of it and celebrate it the, the way they, they want. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yep. Amen. I love it. That was a feel good Christmas moment, Landon. I was getting goosebumps and tearing up. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. Well, I think we've discussed Christmas and that's really fun. Um, now we, so last year, Landon and I were feeling kind of creative, right? And we wrote a poem called, uh, Twas the Night Before Christmas in Old Nauvoo. Now, last year, Mormonish had just barely started. We started in November. So we were just a month old and we went out on a limb and we asked the amazing RFM, who has the incredible voice for radio, to read this poem. And, and he did. He agreed. I was really surprised because we were brand new. We didn't know him very well at the time, but he was so kind. And he did read it. And we put a little kind of cartoon graphic to it. And we put it out, I think, a couple places. And I think we put it out on TikTok. But we weren't very well known at, at that point. So I don't think a lot of people got to hear it. So we thought this year, who better than to read this poem with us than the amazing Rob Lauer with his theatrical back <laughs> background. So we are going to read this poem um, as kind of a little funny Christmas gift to everybody. And this is how we imagine the night before Christmas in old Nauvoo. So let's go to our first slide, Landon, and I'll read the first one, then we'll have Landon read and then Rob can read. So, okay. all right. Twas the night before Christmas and all through Nauvoo, the saints were asleep and they hadn't a clue. The husbands were sent on their missions abroad and none were the wiser the whole thing's a fraud. The apostles were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of tithing funds danced in their heads. The Danites, the Masons, Nauvoo Legion too were peacefully sleeping that night in Nauvoo. When out on the street there arose such a clatter, they sprang from their beds to see what was the matter. They pulled back the curtains and loosened the cord. An angel stood brandishing a long flaming sword. With a bottle of whiskey coming home from the barn, the angel stopped Joseph and extended his arm. 
I've got a message, said the heavenly host, from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In a world full of tragedy, pain, and despair, this is the message God wants me to share. There's only one thing that God asks you to do. Marry more women, or he'll destroy you. Now Fanny, now Zena, now Emma, now Sarah, on Emily, on Liza, on Helen, on Almera, the Relief Society counselors, your harem will grow. Elizabeth, Miranda, and Eliza R. Snow. Joseph froze where he was and stood very still. Guess I don't have a choice. It's clearly God's will. The problem, of course, to get Emma on board. A revelation ought to do it, straight from the Lord. So then in a twinkling, he leapt to his task. How could he not, if that's what the Lord asked? He was dressed like a general. From his head to his feet, he was ready to woo all the girls he would meet. From the red brick store to the Masonic Hall, Joseph beckoned the cistern to answer his call. He wrote letters of happiness to get ladies alone, but he couldn't even find one with a hat and a stone. He peeped in the windows, he scried at the doors, he tiptoed down hallways and crept across floors. The everlasting covenant was his only desire, or perhaps it's more likely his loins were on fire. He suddenly turned, of her presence aware, see mothers and daughters and sisters in pairs. The women were seething, their faces abhorred. We heard of your plan, and we were not fallen for it. You're a scoundrel, a scumbag, and worse than that we've seen, you'll even wed girls just shy of 15. And in front of the crowd stood Emma, his wife, which really made Joseph afraid for his life. <laughs> We'll finish the job that the mob couldn't do. You're speaking as a man and we're on to you. They had him surrounded. We won't be your wife. Bring the tar and the feathers and the castrating knife. Joseph sprang to his horse. His tooth gave a whistle and he rode out of Nauvoo at the speed of a missile. And the women exclaimed as he faded from sight, Merry Christmas, old Joe. You're getting nothing tonight. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I think that that is a faith-promoting story for those <laughs> of us who believe that everybody would have been a lot better off if polygamy had never been introduced. You know what? That's one way that's to look at opinion. it. That's my yep. way of looking at it. No, that's it. That's just kind of our little imaginary trip into Nauvoo at Christmas time. Right, Landon? That was... <laughs> Absolutely. I know. It makes me laugh. And we were being facetious, of course. So, But we were just... We're trying to be funny. Isn't that right? So, well, I think this has been really fun. And I hope you guys have learned something and felt a little Christmas spirit and a little Christmas cheer. And we're going to be airing this a few days before Christmas. Um, so we just want to wish everybody from Mormonish and from Rob, just, just have a wonderful Christmas and a very happy holidays, everybody. Landon, do you have any final Christmas wishes? And then Rob, and then we'll sign off and let everybody get back to their shopping, right? <laughs> That's right. Just Merry Christmas, everyone. It's been a, a fantastic year here at Mormonish, and we, we certainly a, a, a appreciate all of our viewers and listeners and wanted to wish them a Merry Christmas and just have a kind of a fun episode. That's so, right. As one of your dedicated viewers and having been a guest few times, thank you for Mormonish. And uh, you guys have a Merry Christmas and everybody out there. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Blessed Solstice. Blessed Yule. Whatever you're celebrating, <laughs> celebrate and be happy. Yep. I love that. I think the bottom line is, as Rob said so eloquently, bringing light into the world. However you celebrate it, you take time once a year just to imagine and to celebrate the light that comes into the world and comes into your life, however you celebrate it. So thank you, everybody. Please like and subscribe to Mormonish and um, comment. Let us know how you and your family celebrate Christmas. Let us know if you've stepped away more from certain traditions that you had in the past, how you found new traditions and new ways to celebrate light coming into the world. Um, if you'd like to be made aware of new Mormonish episodes and when they come out, you can hit that notification bell. And also, if you'd like to support Mormonish financially, you can see ways to donate in the show notes. We always link uh, links to PayPal and to Venmo if you'd like to help support us. And we certainly do appreciate everyone, especially this time of year, who does support the channel. It means so much to us. So again, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and thanks everybody from Mormonish. Have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas, everyone. Bye-bye. Christmas. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. 
You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.